Dysentery is mostly good at classifications. Same thing with the K nearest neighbors. To predict the nominal label, it can also be used to predict interval target variables, but it can get weird in some cases when the leaves are very small. So supervised, be aware of the overfitting. You'll see a similar graph with the overfitting lines, but the x-axis will denote a different feature about the model. For k nearest neighbor, the x-axis is about k. k goes smaller from the largest. When k is the largest, it's the simplest model. For trees, it's the size of the tree. It's how many leaves. We'll take a look at the tree. So this is the simple tree in SAS interface. It's an upside down tree where the root is on the top. It starts from one node and it branches out. A couple of features you can see here. Based on twofold cross validation, you always have two columns for the statistics. You have a train and a validation. The validation is shown to you to let you see differences. The bigger the difference, the stronger the signal of the overfitting is. But that's about one leaf. That's not the whole story. You need to look at the entire tree to see how much overfitting is happening. And typically, as you go toward the root, which is the upper portion, overfitting is less likely because it's the first split. The model is good at picking up the most important predictive features. So those are not likely to be overfitting as you go deeper and deeper and go into the branches and leaves, you start to see overfitting. This entry gives you a very graphic view of the different portion of the predictions and you can see the overfitting. Depending on the setting of the model, you can sometimes split into two branches every time or you can split to more than two branches. So that adds more complexity to the model. What is the thickness of the lines? Some lines are thicker, some lines are thinner. The thickness of the lines, the branches, indicates the relative number of observations going into that branch. If you have a split that makes two very different size splits, with one branch having 10% of the sample, the other branch having 90%, you'll see a dramatic difference in the thickness. And the reason why it's splitting this way versus alternative ways, I'll explain shortly. With the bigger branches, it will show a thicker box around the branch. Every box is called a node. Separation is called a split. After the split, it's one branch versus the other, and the branch will further split. That's how the tree grows. So what is a split? A split is a decision rule that separates the sample into, in this case, two branches. It separates the branch into two mutually exclusive sets based on one variable. In this case, this is the donation data set. The most informative variable is the gift count 36 months. It's the number of gifts that the person has made within the past 36 months that's the most informative variable to split uh, first on the entire sample. If this variable is smaller than 2.5, it goes to the left. If it's larger than or equal to 2.5, or if the value is missing, it's uh, included on the right branch. So you can see that focusing on the training, the original data set has 1,813 points. After the split, it has 22 183 on the left and slightly more on the right and still within the training the overall sample has fairly balanced outcomes right and after the split look at what happens for the training set for the left branch 57 percent are non-donor only 42 percent are donor as versus on the right you have majority donor than non-donor so based on only one split you're better able to predict. You make fewer mistakes. And same thing on the validation. It used to be evenly split. After one split, you have fairly consistent values, if not identical. The difference is because of randomness. The consistency is because 
This split is a good split. It leads to better model. It didn't lead to overfeeding. Then you will make more splits. Know that based on the procedure of the decision tree, the first split is almost always the most informative split. It almost always doesn't lead to overfitting in the first step. As you go down, overfitting becomes more likely. You can imagine as it goes down, the sides of each node become smaller because it's branching out over and over and over. As it gets to a point where the node size is too small, you can't really trust the prediction there because it's too much into the local patterns. That's when the overfeeding likely will happen. If you see this split with all the branches, with all the nodes before and after, you can write out a clear decision split, a decision rule, that's what we call. A decision rule focuses on how the split happens from one branch to two branches. And you would describe a few elements here. The if condition is the feature by which the split happens. The level of the split so the if condition includes that too. Which variable and which level? And then if then, if it's on the left, what happens? Predictions are based on the majority vote. That makes sense? On the left, everybody here will be predicted non-donor because the majority is non-donor. By no means this is a final prediction. But at this point, the decision rule is like that. Questions? We'll go to the demo from this point on. So this is an illustration of one decision rule. Okay, so let's do the demonstration. We will use a different data set. We'll use the PVA97, which is the same donation data set, but with a different name. We'll create a new data source. All right, I may do something here. So the first thing is uh, to revise the target. We need only one target, one and only one. Um, we'll keep the B, target B, which is the donation yes or no decision. We will reject the other uh, target. So I, uh, I changed a few metadata rules, uh, which may, you know, result in different, uh, different, lab different levels here. Just let me sort the name. Oh, I mean, no, let me sort the level. And you can, there are only three binary, so make sure you have the same three. And a lot of uh, intervals, starting from the GIF, and, and some more gift here, and the promotion are all intervals. The nominal ones including include the, uh, the ID and status, gender, gift count 36. It's nominal because there are only very few unique values, but gift count 36, I will still, I will, st I will still com convert it to, in it doesn't allow me. I don't know what, or oh, a cluster. Count 36, it should, I would uh, change it to interval. This one, promo count card interval. And um, for decision trees, this probably don't even matter. Uh, because because the way uh, decision trees calculate different splits. I'll talk more about that. It's actually what I'm doing here for these sort of uh, wrongly, wrongly designated level variables. They <coughs> practically won't matter even if I change it. And uh, you understand why I want to talk about uh, the split rules. So the only nominal variables left are the ID 
cluster, status, and gender. Right. Decision rules, we would have uh, decision rules in donation cases because, right, because the two decisions would have different cost and benefit. Uh, but for, for now, we'll keep it simple. So now uh, I'll create a diagram decision tree. So I only I only have three minutes. So let's do a interactive tree growth, and let me explain the backend. Uh, drag the data set. So to save the time, I'll skip the Stat Explorer, but you understand what we were supposed to do with the Stat Explorer, right? Um, but here, I need to do the partition because that's going to be important. The, the cross-validation part, it, it will be under sample, cross-validation, uh, data partition. And let's do a 50-50 or here, let's do 60 and 40. Okay, um, and then <coughs> the decision tree it looks like a tree. Let me edit the name. And at least, <coughs> at least I would need to run <coughs> until the data partition. So review the partitions. Uh, <coughs> we basically, we focus on the proportion of the <coughs> donors versus non-donors in the three sets. In the overall data sets, 50-50 split. The same thing in the two uh, s partition sets. So as, as far as the distribution of the target, it looks very well. And you see more uh, data, more data point in the train set because I set 60% for the train. So that's all good. <coughs> uh, everything's good, following along. There's one more thing to do. So here, uh, with, the, with the tree, uh, let's go to the interactive. So you see a roof uh, node there. You cannot drag it. Similar view, you have a training and validation set. It's 50-50 split uh, of the outcome on both, as, as you saw previously. You have more count, more data points in the training set because we set 60%. And uh, you can, you know, manually, you can interactively split the first node by going split node. It will give you a contextual menu. So this one illustrates how it's split. Um, <coughs> what are these? These are different variables and labels. Label the variable. And so you have uh, give count 36, give average card 
I don't know, car, um, gift average last, and things like that. For the different variables, it calculates a, a informative um, value, st stat here, statistics, minus log p. Um, what does it mean? It simply means the variable worth. So uh, the, the bar graph that you see in the stat explorer, it's based on the values here. So the average, uh, the gift count 36 would be the first bar because it has highest minus log P. So what is minus log P? It's, uh, it's, it's some transform, value, transform version of P, but what's P? P is a p-value of a chi-squared test uh, between the input and the target. Now, a chi-squared test basically tests correlation, but it's a, it's a correlation um, measure that can extend to nominal variables, right? It's different from a uh, row, which is a Pearson correlation. Uh, the Pearson correlation has limitation because it only apply to uh, interval variables. You know, a lot of times we make predictions, we make uh, classifications, the target is binary. And sometimes nominal, sometimes have more than two levels. And those, those three, those the more than two levels cannot be <coughs> ranked. So without the ranking, without the ordering of the data, you cannot use row. Pearson correlation. So you have to use something else. Chi-square is a more generalized version of the correlation measure. Now once you have a correlation, you have a p-value of that statistic. You know, with, with the, the, nor the, the conventional statistical testing, the larger the, the statistic, the smaller the p, right? The larger the, s the, the, the statistic, which is the chi-square, the more uh, the stronger the correlation is and the smaller the p is. So that just means, you know, a, a better correlated variable, but you have a smaller p. So you have to reverse the scale. The minus sign is here to reverse the scale. And taking the log is making the p larger to be more clear. So then that's all the transformation you, you need to do. You know, just rest assured all those transformations make sense. Uh, to the mathematicians, so we just trust them. Um, but after all the transformations, you have, you know, these nice values that are discernible. That they, they are that they can be um, differentiated. The and and this table ranks the variables according to the minus log p. So it's it's a it's a it's a list of ordered uh, variable importance basically. Right, the first variable appear to have the highest correlation with the target. So that would be the ideal um, split, um, split rule uh, feature, right? But still, every variable has multiple values that you can split the sample, right? Let's say for gift count 36, um, there are people who made zero gift uh, within 36 months. There are people who made one. There are people who made two. To uh, to split the sample, you can split by two, uh, lower than two or larger than two, or in, uh, equal to two. You can use three. You can use four. Which value does it pick? SAS will calculate every alternative and compare the log p and retain the strongest one. And here the strongest one is 2.5. So SAS has, has done all the calculation for you. And it has retained the, the optimal split value for each of these variables here. Right, so thousands of millions of calculations in the background you didn't see. But SAS is powerful enough to have no delays and just show you the result. Right? So interactively you can also revise the point. You know, if you go to edit rule, you'll see the split point, which is the optimal point of split by SAS standard. But if you somehow say, you know, that doesn't matter, I want to change. So you can change. Um, you can change it to three, something close, something that, that, is, that makes it easier for your business 
to make decisions. You can do that. But you know, know, and know that when you revise the values, you are not you know, <coughs> taking the numerically optimal decision. Um, in sort of saying. So I'm going to accept that. And if I say apply, it will split based on that variable and that decision rule. And you know, this is the same picture that I showed in the slides, right? So uh, as, as far as um, this tree goes, it's a very simple tree. It, uh, the results are consistent across uh, the two partitions. There's no overfitting detected. When you do the graph, you can see clearly um, the, the, the error is reducing for both, uh, for both partitions. You can do the same interactively over and over to grow the tree. But when do you stop? Do you stop when the leaf is smaller than 100 in size? Do you stop when the accuracy rate is higher than 80%? Or do you stop when you get a clean leaf node? That might be many, many steps. So the stopping point is one decision that you will have to make. There's no perfect decision here. To do that, you try to grow the tree as much as you think it's definitely too much. It's definitely overfitting. And then you can stop. In SAS, there's a default setting. It's set at depth of six. This rule is also governed by other rules. You need to have a minimum number of cases in a node before it can be split. Minimal size may be 10. So if uh, the leaf node only has 10 cases, then you cannot split anymore because there are too few cases there. Any more splitting, you are in adding much more errors into the split because it's too small of a sample. Here, you have many, many cases, so it can keep growing. I didn't change the default. With those defaults, you can choose the automatic mode instead of doing the babysitting mode. So manual mode would be a babysitting. You're splitting manually, one by one. You're babysitting it. You can change the rule. You can edit the rule, the splitting threshold. But I don't see any reason to temper with it. I would uh, simply uh, automatically roll it. So you can train the node is when you try to train it to the maximal sites governed by the rules. So if you do that, it will grow to a depth of six as much as possible. If you see the longest path, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then maybe seven is the default. Um, yeah, and after this point, it doesn't grow anymore. Let's take a look at the sizes of these leaf nodes. So here you can see that uh, for this node, there's only nine points in training set. And the separation on training is very clear. Nine points, all of them have an outcome of one, which is donation. But on validation, it's 50-50. So drastic differences across the partitions. That means here the results are not very you know, reliable big variations across the partitions. This is a signal for overfitting. But this is fine. This is happening to this node. You don't try to eliminate this node at this point. There's a better mechanism to do that. At this stage, I recommend not manually delete. Pruning the tree means to cut it back, to reduce the complexity of the tree. After you have grown the tree to the maximum, you take a look at these leaf nodes and heuristically. Uh, without calculating too much, but get a feel of how much overfitting is there. The growth of the tree is done. This is what we call maximal tree. It's a tree that you are quite confident that is sufficiently large enough that it's overfitting. To demonstrate the differences by following the PDF tutorial, I will freeze the tree so that I will not allow SAS to make any changes to optimize the tree. Here I would uh, change it to a uh, frozen tree. And after that, you probably don't even have to train it because uh, in the interactive steps, it's already trained. So this is a maximal tree and it's frozen. It, it cannot be modified unless you modify this option. Right? So we'll, we'll leave it there.
will train some other trees. Let SAS do all the job and let SAS optimize the best tree. I've talked about tree, those nodes, branch, and grow and split. Grow is meaning splitting a tree. Split metric is the log worth, the ranking of the potential split decision rules. A decision rule is how to split the data based on a particular variable and a particular level. Great question. It's all under the properties. If you look under splitting rule, it's not allowing me to change because I froze a tree. But maximum depth, you can change it to something else. If you are not confident the tree is complex enough, you can modify it to 10. I'll talk about prune a tree. But before I do, I'll talk a little about the homework. In the homework, you will use the telecommunication data set, the churn data set, to grow two trees, I think, based on two metric. After you grow on a tree, the question will ask you to extract the decision rules and make it a table. The decision rule will be similar to what's shown here. Decision rule is describing a split and how the split happens, if then else the condition. If the variable is larger than something, then it goes to left or right. If otherwise, then it goes to the other side. And then you will need to calculate the case, number of cases that went into one side, the confidence of prediction in that branch. So you can extract all the information after you have grown a tree from SAS very quickly, but you'll get a lot of information. You can go to results. After you have grown a tree and run the node, you can go to view, node rules. It gives you a lot of information here. Every section is a, a leaf node, meaning one of the nodes at the bottom, the end of each branch. Each leaf node rule describes the entire chain of decisions from the root node leading up to the leaf node. So we can take an example, a node 22. It's here. Node 22, the node rules describes the path from the root node all the way up to this node. If the status category is one of these levels, and if the median home income is larger than this value or missing, and the last one would be the first split, is if the gift count 36 is smaller than 2.5, then all of those cases that satisfy these conditions will end up in this node 22. So this is one decision rule that you will write to one row of the table, the homework. And then you would do the same for all the end nodes. Here, it, there may be 20 something, so there are quite a lot. For the particular homework question, it may not be the maximal tree, so it's fewer nodes. It doesn't have to be this long. All of these are text you can copy and paste, but it doesn't form a table automatically. And not every information here is what you need. For instance, for the decision rule, you need the if else condition. You can copy these, the if condition, they're almost ready. You probably rearrange them into one row or something like that, and you will be good for that. Then, what decision do you make, right? What prediction do you make? Then you need to look at the statistics, the confidence for either decision and make a pick. So which one is a majority of the cases? And this is describing the training data set result. In this case, the outcome for target being one is 60%, and that's the majority. So in this case, the then consequence result will be donation decision in this case. So your consequent result would be donation or donor. So you can't simply copy and paste everything over there. It won't make sense. You'll have to extract some information here. The third piece of information is number of cases that is in its node. Here, the result tells you it's 147. That's a third cell. Number of cases. And confidence. Confidence is the confidence in predicting that particular outcome. Here, it's 60%. So that would uh, be complete for one decision rule. 
you will do two tables for the homework for two decision trees.